Why do most people hate most people? I just don't understand. It is a fun topic that we're going to be discussing today, and welcome to the study in our uh, fun cigar smoking environment where our magical smoke is going to go to the heavens and help us try to figure out these uh, important questions of why do we feel like we don't like other people. It's an interesting proposition because that, and what makes me think about it is recently and throughout the past couple of years, you see friends and family that all of a sudden they don't want to be around each other. They have opposing views. And, and then we think of other people, oh, they're stu more stupid than I am, or that person's more smart than I am. Oh, screw them. I don't want to be around those people. What is it about our human nature that makes us want to go around only like-minded people and not hear opposing views and not being um, tolerant of people that are much different than we are? It is a, it's a, something that it seems to be ingrained in us now. Well... From my personal opinion and views, I think more of it is not that why we don't like other people, it's that we don't know how to deal with conflict. From an early age, our parents tell us this is what we're supposed to do and these are the consequences if you don't do it. Most people don't listen to their children. They don't know how to talk to their kids. So their kids grow up not knowing how to talk to other people. They don't have that sit down relationship with their parents in the early stages and then when they do, most family arguments are always the worst because you're so close to those people and you think, why can't you understand me? You're part of my genome. Like, why can't you get me? And I think what it really goes down to for me is not that you think somebody's smarter or not that you think somebody's dumber. It's the vocabulary that most people are equipped with. The only tool we have to deal with people on an interpersonal level is words and words are all we have and if you don't know the meaning of all these words you hear these connotative definitions of what society has told us these words so meant. you know how to define a woman yes i do know how to define a woman <laughs> all right well, fantastic but my point is that we let these situations devolve into arguments because we're much like children. We don't ever evolve from that. We don't know how to express ourselves and get our meaning across. So what we break down doing is just throw in a tantrum. We don't think of it as a tantrum because we have other words and we scream and we yell, but we never really get our point across. Most people can't sit down and listen to somebody's opposing argument because they can't actually defend their own argument. They don't know what they really think about the subject. They know what they've been taught and they know what this is the proper stance on it, but they don't actually know how they feel. They don't have the words inside them to express themselves. They don't know how to get from point A to point B. All and right, I, well then how about, that's a, that's a good one. What about if you do have the articulating ability that your words do describe exactly what you mean or feel or understand on a particular subject and you you lay out your argument for somebody and as soon as it is uncomfortable for them listening to a rational argument they shut down and then that leaves the articulate person oftentimes going, well, what's the point? Why do I even want to explain and get into this conversation and discussion or debate with someone when they just shut off? They don't even hear the first thing I'm saying because they will revert back to uh, words going to try to describe their point of view when they can't articulate it and they don't even understand it and they shut off, get mad. And then you're just left going, man, eh, what's the point? I think I'll, if I want to be around this person again, I know not to ever bring up this subject. So I like to think of these situations in two manners because we have no structure in these conversations. Generally, when we have them, they're with family members or they're with friends. 
and we don't set out guidelines, it'd be much more effective if we set it out in more of a debate style where you have to listen to me and I have to listen to you and you can bring your points off of what I said and you do the same. But that's not how it works. It's a free for all. All these conversations are equivalent to a street brawl where there's no rules, there's no regulations, and we try to use our words as weapons as opposed to looking at the great fighters in the boxing ring or UFC ring or anything else. They have this strategy and they know that it's gonna last up to this many rounds. And they know that they need to conserve their energy and they need to conserve their words and they need to push slightly in this direction. When you see somebody come out there and they just want to do nothing but haymakers, they're going to get dropped really quick. They're not going to have a very successful career, and they're not going to be very good at what they do. Even if they can knock you out with one punch, you can't really argue like that because as soon as you get that haymaker, then the other person is trapped. They can't do anything. All they can do is be that caged animal, and they just fight back as, as they can. They shut down. Instead of giving people... All right, a little jab here, a little parry here. You know, the Mayweather, you slide, you dip, you dab. You look for those openings that are in that formal conversation because you know you're going to talk, I'm going to talk, just like this conversation. I have my time to speak. When you feel it's appropriate, you speak, but you don't go straight to interrupting me. More often than not, no. Yeah, more often than not. And just a little bit of structure in those conversations, I think, would go a long way. But you have to understand that that's what you're doing. But You know, our conversations that we've had countless have, from the beginning, even before we started doing this podcast, was a mutual respect for each other's opinion even if the opinions differed, we enjoyed each other so much that we would listen to what the other one had to say. Even if there's a brotherly instinct that goes, oh, I can't wait till he finishes so I can, <laughs> I can get after him with that. You know, that, that's just a, a natural thing. But the, the ability of us to listen to each other is an art form that is not taught. No, it's not. And it is not encouraged. Uh, a rigorous debate teams across the country in high schools and colleges no longer exist. That, that is a, a travesty, another uh, ding on the educational system in the United States. But even a step further than why do most people hate most people, because I, I hear that a lot. I just can't be around people. Oh, I'd just rather be alone than be with you know this group or that group or I think a lot of that resides in when we see other people acting a certain way we have acted that way before so either we have conquered that and we no longer act that way or, or we think we've conquered we, it. yeah we think we have or we still do it and then we don't like that person because they do what we do and so actually, by us not liking to be around certain people is because we don't like certain aspects of ourselves. And that requires the willingness and open-mindedness and open-heartedness to be able to take a step back and go, okay, why don't I like being around? Like, why am I so riled up? Why am I so irritated at this group? or person, or whatever it is, to think, ah, oh, this is bad. Uh, I got to get away from here. I'm done with this conversation. Screw y'all. <laughs> it's over. It's because we don't like those aspects of ourselves. I th agree with you 100%. And to take it one step farther, I think what you said, that you see yourself in those groups because you might have been a part of those groups. Everybody especially I know from coming from me, I have that save the world complex. And I want you to not make those mistakes that I did or mistakes that I thought I've made and I thought I've worked around them. And we want to protect those other people from making those mistakes. But in a lot of cases, we just found out in ourselves that our thinking was wrong and we don't know how to shift 
are thinking to include those people. So we have this idea and we've worked on this idea and we know that they're in the same thing, but they're going the opposite direction. And you're saying, well, I've got the experience here. I've actually been down that road. You really don't know what you're talking about and you want to save them and you're really trying to help. And I think a lot of people genuine, genuinely want help, but they don't really know how. Well, they, uh, in those sor sorts of circumstances, a lot of people have the tendency to give advice when advice is not wanted. Yes. And, and don't have the understanding and the wisdom to say, some people need to go through their own mistakes. They have to learn it on their own. They, they're not going to absorb the wisdom. And now they might if they ask for it and, and they want to learn and they're being inquisitive. Have you ever been through this thing, Trey, that you can help me with? That would be the opportunity to, to have the conversation. But a lot of people just want to pipe up and bring in their limited understanding or in some cases, vast understanding of a particular thing. But that is a real subtle dance. You, know, you, you have to dance uh, and, and storytell and, and bring points home at, at different angles in a way that can reach people. And unless you know them well, that dance can be unpleasant if you're stepping on everybody's toes during the dance. <laughs> I think it can be even more unpleasant if you're very familiar with these people or that person. And I like to think of some of my own shortcomings, especially being much younger and being married in your 20s. You think that you know everything, or at least I did, and I've been proven wrong on so many occasions. <laughs> And I know I've been in a situation where I've been in an argument and halfway through, I realized I was wrong and I could not help but defending my own wrong stance. I'm definitely 100% guilty of that and I'm trying to do better. But if you can recognize that you're making those pitfalls and mistakes first, it all goes back to yourself. You have to start with you. Because if you can't convince yourself of an idea or a topic, you're definitely not going to convince somebody else of that same idea or topic. That's why I love what we do in our conversations. You know, we typically have one or two of these podcasts every week, and it allows just the free-flowing thought process of bantering back and forth with each other allows me oftentimes to distill my own thoughts because we're exercising our minds and I have an inclination to think this way. So why do I think that way? And we verbalize it mm -hmm. and then ultimately end up getting down to the, to the heart of it. And more often than not, and I think that's healthy. And I think that is one of the things that's missing in our society at large is the lack of that. And to have, to hear people say, because I am guilty of it, or responsible for saying it too, is, God, I just don't like a lot of people. I'd rather, if I have a choice, I'd rather be sitting here in the study, reading a book, smoking a fine cigar, and either enjoying the close circle of my friends that we get along well, than doing anything else. But I've had some of my uh, most expansive moments having conversations and dealing with people that have opposing views. It teaches me how to approach people better instead of coming out with a big bulldozer and just want to run over their arguments. I think, okay, well, this person is coming from it, from their experience, from what they've been led to believe is true. And they, from my understanding of this argument, they've got it wrong. Here's why I think it's wrong, but then it goes back to that dance. You have to be really subtle and have a, a certain degree of empathy and understanding uh, with those people. Otherwise, it can be 
very frustrating, and I understand why people could say, oh, I just hate most people. It's because we've all done it, or at least I have. Not near as much now, but I have done it, and it still creeps up sometimes. And there was, has been even recent experiences where I think, God, I just am I'm glad I'm away from that person or that group. And, and because of that, you just think, what am I missing out by denying the opportunity of going to other places? Um, now, a good example is I like to frequent a place called the Petroleum Club. And a lot of friends over the years that have really uh, benefited my life, and hopefully I've benefited theirs. And everybody is sort of segregated. You know, the little group of people over here, a little group over here, a little group over here, and over here, and over there. you know, there'll be a little commingling around, but primarily they'll stay in their spot. And by not engaging more with those other people, because I know they think a little differently than me, I just avoid them. But I've had some of the best conversations whenever I did engage with those people, even when it was irritating to me. It, it helped expand my comfort zone. It helped me realize that, hey, maybe I don't know everything and I should just listen. I should close my mouth and absorb more through my ears <laughs> and then try to dwindle down what it is I want to say instead of allowing my emotions to get the better of me. And then when I leave, I think, well, they were, they were idiots. And then I have to go, okay, well, I was an idiot too because I got riled up. I let them get the better of me because I didn't have control over myself. Much like I said earlier is we don't have, I don't think that we feel that we have the vocabulary to get to those people sometimes. And I think you said something really important when you said, and I'm paraphrasing that it was more comfortable to stay in this group or that group. And when you go outside, you know that you're going to have conflict and all humans have this desire to be comfortable. Most people don't have the desire to start and engage in conflict because one, it tests you, it tests the other person. You might not like who you turn out to be at the end of that conversation. You might not like who the other person is going to be at the end of the conversation. And you might need to do business deals or just be around those people at family gatherings. And you don't want to have that uncomfortability. But the uncomfortability stems from not, it really comes from you, that you couldn't get your point across and they couldn't understand you because you want them to be on your side. And well, doesn't it go back to fear too? Because it definitely goes back yeah, to so, fear. Yeah. So you're you're fearful of of perhaps looking stupid in your argument, or are there more of them with their idea? So you're fearful of being uh, rejected out. You are uh, fearful of not being able to articulate your points whenever you believe you're right. So fear is ultimately it becomes the inhibitor of, of personal growth because it's much easier to walk off and go, I just hate most people. <laughs> <laughs> that is the easier form. I mean, it's very easy to say, all right, I don't like that person. I don't want to deal with them. Not, I probably should deal with that person because even if I can't sway them to my line of thinking, if I have to deal with them, like in the petroleum club where you see these guys on a regular basis and you might not like them or not necessarily that you don't like them, but you not, might not like what they have to say. And you're afraid that if you rub them the wrong way, you might need them later. And it's easier and safer to just say, I don't really like those people. And if I need them, I want to keep that open window to if I do need them. I don't want to make them angry. Whereas instead, but we're in this society, in this culture that if you upset me, it's okay that I cut you off. I just block you. It's so easy to block people. You can block them on Facebook, block them from your number, block them from really every aspect of your life. And Which, you hit on something that's really important is 
that the way that things are taught in this country, there has been several events over the last few years where this huge idea has been forced on the masses and all sources tell you this is a way to do it. And if you look deeper and you think about all the common sense and logic that goes along with that, there is no logical response to if you were born a man and you want to translate into a woman and you want to swim with the women. <laughs> it's and society tells you that's okay. All right, you you can be who you want to be and that's Fine if you want to be who you want to be, but you can't take the easy way and compete mentally or physically on a field that you know that you can dominate and not because you're physically able to dominate it, but because the powers that be and the society we live in have given you that grace that you can go ahead and bowl through there and people have to respect you and have to listen to you even if they don't agree with you there is no repercussion because then they're labeled as a bigot, bigot transphobe racist or whatever else we've shut down all these avenues for discussion we don't want discussion we live in a society of specifics where this is a doctor of this and this is a doctor of this but there's no crossing there nobody wants to look at the other avenues so say oh well he's a he's an expert in that field so i have to listen to the expert in that field it's kind of like a dispelling uh when you say doctors uh, most doctors aren't taught nutrition so whenever no. doctors are are introduced to all these nutritional benefits of whether it's supplements or diet or whatever, they just shut down because they've been indoctrinated to believe well, there's a pill to cure everything. Uh, you know, basically that's the point. You know, there's there's some solution instead of taking care of the root problems. So they, they shut down too. And uh, it's just a really strange phenomenon. But one reason why I enjoy going so much to the club is because it, to me it's one last bastion of freedom where in that place in, in my circle of friends there we enjoy bantering in a very hard way like there is no holes barred like they were anybody is just as happy as they can be to say uh fuck you that's <laughs> a good example and or you're a wuss. It, but nobody gets their feelings hurt more often than not. Because it's just, uh, they're men, they're being masculine, they're, uh, but they're all friends. And somebody may get a little uh, butt hurt for a second, but then it just goes right away and everybody still gets together and have for, you know, decades. So th there is that with a certain group that I hang out with that I find refreshing. Nobody's canceling each other uh, and such, but there is some self-restraint from the past two years of being politically correct. And I, I had a really good friend of mine in his sixties that uh, walked into the club uh, I don't know, I guess it was a year and a half, two years ago, wearing a face covering. And he was the only one. But everybody had theirs in their pockets, you know, because you got to go through the building and go up to the elevators, be on the top floor and all that sort of thing. I said, what are you doing? Like, why? Why, why, are, why are you doing that thing? And, well, it's just easier. I don't have to listen to any hassle. It's just easier for me to do it and then I can take it off whenever I get in here. And see, I, I find that, I found that repulsive. <laughs> like I just found it repulsive. And we really didn't even have a conversation about it other than me uh, chastising him in a word or two. I probably called him a, a wuss or something like, where's your manhood or something to that effect. And then, you know, we changed the subject and talk about whatever business is at hand that day. <laughs> well, those are dirty words in today's society. Manhood, to even separate and say that men and women are different. That's a huge thing now, which... Which is, makes you go, why well, I hate people. I got to get away from these people. <laughs> you, it does. It makes it easier to say, I, I hate people. That's all. That's the easy way. But if you really want to change, if you really want to live in a society of freedom 
with the growth and prosperity for yourself and others, it's very important to hear conflicting views because just because this is a traditional way to do it or this is the way that it's been done or this has been found easier for you does not make it easier for everyone. I love that point. And I think it's very valuable that we, as a individual and as a broader humanity, rise up and realize that it's good to be outside of our comfort zone. Realize that we don't have to bulldoze our thoughts and philosophies into somebody. If what we're saying rings true and we have some empathy for the other person, we have some compassion for their own individual humanity and we can talk to them respectfully and subtly get to our points, then and live outside of our comfort zone some. It allows us to grow. It allows them to grow. It allows us to be more accepting of each other and to not automatically cancel each other out and go, oh, God, I hate people. I got to get out of this room. I got to get away from this group. I think it benefits us more if we can listen, have a discussion, and not be fearful of, oh, whatever they may say may change my mind. That is the point of growth is that we do change our mind with different uh, learning, with different open-mindedness to be able to, oh, I didn't know that point. Oh, I didn't know that history. I didn't know that, uh, you know, quackery of chiropractic uh, work was good. Uh, the, you know, all sorts of, there's just so many things that that are beneficial to us if we just have a better open mind. And so we go to this, the, the idea of, it's better for us to, as, as men and women, to be able to have conversations that get us out of our comfort zones, to get us into a level of human respect and dignity for each other. And that is a difficult, long road, especially in a country where you're right. I'm wrong, but I'm never going to admit I'm wrong, and then vice versa. I'm right, and you're wrong, and I don't care if you're right. I'm still right. <laughs> I, so, so I really like what you said about the, you're afraid that somebody will change your mind because I've came across this point with a certain family member where it says, oh, you can't brainwash me. I don't want to hear what you're going to say. So you're so worried that what I'm going to say is going to change your mind, you don't want to hear it. What sense does that make? If my argument is logical and it makes sense, then why would you ever be afraid of hearing the truth? Why is the truth in today's time tucked away and sheltered and we want to cover it up? Why is the truth something now that is dirty? Why is everybody afraid to have their mind changed? What is the problem with having some mental flexibility? Because you can hear a point and say, okay, that doesn't exactly go with my line of thinking, but I can use that to build upon and make my argument stronger. I can listen to what you have to say, and I can counteract your point. And I don't think it's anything wrong with giving up ground and giving away a couple points here or there within a debate or a discussion where you don't have to be 100% correct. Your goal and objective just needs to be met. It needs to be get to boil down. Conversations are meant to boil everything down to the truth. That is what you hope for. And in this shot, this reminds me of something that's very interesting because we have Napoleon in the background. And I had a discussion last weekend, or actually I guess it was a couple weekends ago, and it was about the Louisiana Purchase. And it was a perfect example of I started to almost get frustrated and I was like, you know what? I'm not going to convince this person of my point of view. And my point of view was pretty simple. They said something about the Louisiana Purchase. I said, you know, really, we didn't pay for the Louisiana Purchase. Completely shut them off and would not listen. And I was like, I mean, all you have to do is listen to me and you can fact check me that we did not repay our war debt to France. We said it was to the French crown. And when they had their upheaval and their revolution, now we don't owe that debt. So we got away with about $12 million in debt that we owed the French crown. Then when Napoleon needed money to fuel his war chest because he was getting pounded on every angle, he sold us the Louisiana Purchase 
for less than $12 million. So we only repaid part of the war debt that we defaulted on. And then my second point on that was that just like in the Bible and the promised land that is given to you people, you might have paid for it, but if I give you a building that's full of occupants and they're living there and you kick them out and you force them somewhere else, you have stolen it. Just because this higher power, this God or this Napoleon or whatever is giving you this land because you spent some kind of money on it, but doesn't make it yours. It doesn't make it yours because Napoleon didn't give those people compensation for it. We forget that we pushed all those natives off the land. So we, we stole, stole it again after we had already stolen it. And then we were going to steal it a third time because the land, after the government buys it, and they dish out the land to all these private landholders to cultivate the land and to make it a part of our country, well, now those people don't actually own it either. They're paying rent to the state. We still don't own the land. The government owns it, and we get to pay them rent on it. So for the third time, the Louisiana Purchase has been stolen. Yeah, and whenever you, you just brought up uh, the Bible, and I think religious discussions, along with political, but especially religious discussions, instantly shut people off. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of, uh, of things that are in the Bible themselves that uh, are just outright repulsive unless you are a murderer. Like we're reading Ezekiel right now. We we took a hiatus from our course. And if y'all haven't seen it, you, know, uh, you can go to mysticsoftexas.com and there's uh, we go through each book of the Bible in depth uh, from a layman's perspective and just read it and dissect it and try to understand it. And it is so full of contradictions and so full of death and destruction and we're God says, uh, like in Ezekiel right now, I think I'm on chapter 18, but in, in this chapter and the previous few, he's talking about uh, how he is, he's had God himself is happy that he's killing women and infants. And, and it's so difficult to read. And you're just like, what? What? This is the Bible? So if you mentioned those little words that I said just now about a book in the Bible where God is happy to kill women and infants, man, people will shut off like that. They'll think, oh, you must be the devil. You are evil. For I'm, I'm just reading what you, you say. This is a holy book. And this is what this God believes in. All of a sudden, people shut off and go, Oh, I hate that person. Oh, that person's going straight to hell. That, I, I got to get away from those parties. This is bad. I can't listen to this. And, and that's a big, uh, a, a big lack of a void. Uh, this, this, or are there not a lack of it? There is a. We've created this huge void, and there's a lack of understanding in this country and many others that that I wish was not missing. And that is what we're talking about now to say, I don't hate everybody. I don't dislike that person because he thinks differently. Let me hear what he has to say to see if there's some value in it and to see if I can learn something. Well, I'm glad you brought up the Bible because I'm sure that there are a lot of people out there that when they see me, they know not to mention the Bible because I'm one of the few people that I know of other than you that have read the Bible. And now we're reading it again from the layman's perspective and trying to just go in depth with the Bible. And I think a lot of people's problem is they've not read the Bible. And just like I said earlier, they look to these authorities of the Bible. They think that they've dedicated their lives to knowing and understanding the Bible. When really a preacher doesn't actually do that. They want to be just as comfortable as everybody else. They want their gig where they work one to six hours a week and get paid in their house. And that's what they want. They want to make everybody feel good. They want you to keep coming back. They, they're the McDonald's. They know that their food is crap, but they also know that their food 
tastes good and it makes you feel a certain way. So you have these feel-good things that these preachers bring out in the Bible, and it's not the whole story. And what I like to do now as I'm having these conversations with people about the Bible, I used to ask them, all right, well, what about this? And what about this? And you can put this and this and this, and nobody ever wants to hear that. But one thing that I've seen now that I don't necessarily think it shuts down the conversation because I'm not trying to come in with like a bulldozer, but I bring up the story of the Tower of Babel. And all these people want to come together in the spirit of community and harmony, and they all speak the same language, and they're getting along. They have a common goal, and they want to build this tower. But what does the God figure of the Bible do? He makes them speak different languages so they can no longer cooperate and no longer do their goal. So my question to these people is, is if God doesn't want everyone on earth to have the same goal. He wants strife and he wants division. Like there's a perfect chance to unify everybody and they were already unified. Why now do they have to speak different languages and come through different contexts to come to these same ideas? Why is that frowned upon? Through the Bible itself has sown derision and conflict when it doesn't have to. So you tell me that you're going to go to heaven, which is this magical place where everybody gets along and everybody cooperates, but that has been the case. And you can just look at two times in the Bible, the Garden of Eden, if you will, and then the Tower of Babel, where everyone was on the same page, where there was a point in human existence per the Bible that we were getting along, but this God creature, or whatever you want to call him, has broken that connection to sow derision, to sow strife. So we talk about, or those people talk about, oh, Satan, you're going straight to hell. You're listening to Satan. Well, what did Satan actually do in the Bible? Satan wanted to give knowledge of good and evil to the first peoples. That seems like a very noble goal like that should be something that you would want to know you are is, bad exactly right <laughs> you are bad mr smith <laughs> and then you go to the second form you have the tower of babel where everybody was getting along that is a heaven on earth situation everybody is coming together nobody's hating each other from the story and into context but there is that outside force that pushes the derision. So we're forced to not like people. So I think that we go to this huge collection of, well, I can't like this person because they think differently because they don't come along with me. So they, they've got to be bad. They've got to be wrong. They don't agree with this. But then if you go back and you actually read, well, who does go with that? Whose side are you really on? Are you on the side of the good, which allegedly is good and has split people and all these different factions around the world to speak different languages or are you on the side of let's get together and let's figure out where our shortcomings are and how can we fix them but that's hard I, I, it, it is difficult i uh <laughs> it, it, it's people shut off when they you bring up politics our religion, and I think that is the the point where we need the discussions the most. It is, and and the discussions on inner growth and how we develop ourselves and to be the best possible people that we can be on an individual basis, and then realize that the reason why we don't like a lot of people is because we are so similar to those people, and there are aspects subconsciously within ourselves that we don't like. And we take it out on those other people. And that is uh, something that we are all responsible for because whether it is talking about uh, the Bible or whether it's talking about any number of subjects that have become offensive, like uh, a good one is the, this depopulation thing that we hear about all the time. Uh, you know, we just have too many people on this planet. Uh, whether you, uh, whoever you're listening to, any of these eugenics people, we need to get the population down to, you know, whatever number that they feel is appropriate. And I have, and you have, a specific member of our family, they'll go unnamed, that says, oh, yeah, we got way too many people. Yeah, they, they probably wouldn't be bad, you know, if we lost a good, a good chunk of them. 
you know, whether it's through uh, GMO food or uh, all these bad, harmful things we're putting in our body. Oh, oh, that's good. That's good. And I'll uh, continue to use, you know, Roundup and glyphosate and, and all these bad things all around me. Oh, <laughs> knowing full well that, that those are carcinogens and they're bad for you, you're going to be one of the people that are gone. Like you're, you're hoping for your own destruction, thinking that you're immune. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. It's, it's all craziness. So that certain person you're talking about. <laughs> is, By the way, certain person, if yeah. you're watching, uh, we love you. <laughs> so it's, it's interesting because I've had these same conversations with that person and they don't think there's anything wrong with these GMOs or they don't think there's anything wrong with this or that because they think that, well, this is the answer to solving this hunger crisis or this is how we can feed people to keep the population going when they don't realize the broader scope of the whole conversation. Because I always think it's interesting that at one point in this country's existence, doctors prescribe cigarettes to patients. And we think, oh, that's crazy. Cigarettes are so bad. And tobacco is so bad. But if you look at the numbers, when doctors prescribe cigarettes to patients, they weren't made the same way. They didn't have all the carcinogens and the, they were more of a natural tobacco. And look at the cancer rates of that time in the United States' history as opposed to the introduction of GMO quality foods and herbicides and pesticides, the cancer rates, if you just look at the numbers, are up thousands of percentages as now when there's less people smoking than when there was the vast majority of people smoking. So that would have to lead you to believe that to, to buy, it's not the tobacco that's bad, tobacco is a plant. And Some any plants plant. are bad for you, but uh, you know, tobacco, uh, I have several neuroscientist buddies of mine that uh, the elasticity of the brain is improved dramatically by using tobacco, such as cigars. And I agree with you. There are a lot of things that are good for us that are told that are bad. And some things that are really, really bad that we're taught that are good, like our good friend thinks GMOs are wonderful. They do think GMOs are wonderful. And it's one of those things that you have to use the slow drip method because... <laughs> one bucket at a time. <laughs> Well, this certain person, I had the pleasure of being with them a couple of weeks ago and they went to go get some corn from Mennonites right. and they don't use any herbicides, any pesticides, and it's a raised in a organic environment. And yeah, they gave me some of those. Yeah. And they got this corn and they were raving for weeks and are still raving about how wonderful it is. And they said, Oh, Trey, you don't like corn. You, why don't you taste it? You, you're going to love it. And I'm like, my problem is not with the corn itself. You misunderstand my whole take on the matter. And this is why we have this strike. Right? This is why you can't hear me is the corn is not the problem. What I don't like is if you go back and look at all the law cases of where Bear and Monsanto and DuPont have stolen farms from people producing corn in the right way because they wanted their land. The problem is, is these corporations have stolen and use their war chest to take away from the smaller individual so that they can globalize the production and corner the market in a now legal way. That is my problem with it. And they, they can't understand me when I say it. So you have to do it in small drips. It's like, yeah, that corn is really good. Now get the corn from Kroger or Walmart or Super One and taste the difference. Well, that corn doesn't taste the same. Well, why does it not taste the same? Well, when you look at the GMO records is GMO products only have to have around 60% of the taste quality that organics have to have. Anything less than that, people don't buy it. Well, it goes to back to the argument of whenever, just argument in general, the discussion of argument, why we hate people, which I don't think, I don't hate people like I did uh, 
for a number of hopefully uh, it's the start of this conversation right for <laughs> for a long time I, I am responsible for my emotions and thought processes and, and thought that I hate people not everybody but I hate most people and then I, I over time I just began to realize that I don't hate the person. I actually love that person. I've come to understand and realize that we are all connected, that we, uh, as Kennedy says, we all breathe the same air, and that we're all connected in water, we're connected in, in this space, and we, we can learn to work together and, and be beneficial for each other, mutually beneficial and respectful of each other. And to come to learn that they have their points of view from their experience and the influences around them. And I have the same on my side. And there is a way for us to come together to talk, to research, to do the things necessary to find the truth the best we can. And when you come at the thought of, oh, I don't like people to well, I have to have people. Humans are social. I enjoy being around people that I like. So if I can communicate in a way that is beneficial for both of us, the people that I didn't really like before, and maybe leave with one drop of my understanding on them, and they give me a drop of their understanding, maybe that water will meld together and maybe we can figure a way in the future of how to make humanity go forward in a positive direction without that instant thought that uh, many of us have had is, oh, I just can't stand people. <laughs> I, I think there is a way and I think that takes education, it takes practice, it takes understanding, it takes us teaching the youth that and their children, because I think it's too late for most people set in their ways in their 40s and 50s and 60s. Most people are closed. So as those younger generations grow up, maybe we can teach them, I hope, to have an open mind, to come together in a way that we can have open, honest discussions without um, bias. Well, everybody's going to always have a little bias, but without a hidden agenda to promote or push something that is nefarious, that we can just talk amongst each other, do our own research, and figure out what is right and live happily ever after. I hope humanity gets to that point. I think we cannot get to that point Oh, you naysayer. <laughs> without, well, no, I'm, I'm giving us a call to action here. I don't think we can get to that point without genuine self-reflection. And what I mean and what I've done in my practices lately is when someone disagrees with me, no matter how crazy it is, <laughs> sometimes I would like to do that, but, but no matter how much I disagree or they disagree with me, especially if you need to be close to that, person because the person I'm thinking of now has a tie to me which I don't really like the person themselves but I think when they speak they do give out valuable information but they don't know how to frame their information so every time I talk with them you have to really think about what they're saying for example this is something that and this is one of the reasons why I don't care for this person. This person does not on the outside look necessarily super fit. And at one point in my life, I was extremely fit and had great success with that. So I know how to work out on how to treat myself. I know how to come to these goals that I want. And this person said something that, oh, oh, you only need to work out once a week and, and you'll be fit. It's like, all right, that is really the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard because you can't expect to put in one hour of work or two hours of work or even three hours of work at anything per week and expect that to really pay off. But if you dig down and you think, okay, this person might have valuable information, but they don't know how to express it to me. They're a child with a 
with a vocabulary that doesn't get their point across and all they know how to do is kick and scream when you don't listen to them. So if you dig down and you think, well, what are you trying to say? All right, the body needs breaks to repair itself because after you stress something, you need to rebuild. Like after that conversation, you need to rebuild and regroup and think and build on your own mental understanding. Now on that point is if you work out one muscle group per week, but you work out every day and you only did biceps and you only did triceps and you only did legs or you only did this per week and you blow that muscle out, that is a very effective way of training. But again, you have to listen to what they have to say, then self-reflect and say, I can understand where you were trying to come from after I stepped back and really thought about what you were saying, but you had no idea how to express yourself. And I think so many people don't know how to express themselves. They have no idea. No, they get upset. They start uh, uh, crying. Like we had uh, to our sanctuary here where we come together every Sunday at 1 30 is uh, we had some people with us several months ago and one girl just started uh, crying because uh, her feelings were hurt that nobody was fully understanding her point. That goes to the heart of here. I don't I think she uh, couldn't wait to leave. And now, you know, after a few months of reflection, she wants to come back. <laughs> I'm like, okay, you're always welcome to come back. And we were having this conversation of people on welfare. Uh, why, why are they on welfare? I didn't have anything and I worked hard and I became... Uh, it, you know something in the healthcare industry and and successful and I pulled myself up and, uh, and I don't know why they you know, walk around because we have this thing here in the south or I don't know where else it might be in the world but um, people in the hood like to wear their pants around their halfway falling down their ass and uh, all those things that, and uh, I made the point uh, to her that. You have to just think about it in a way, because I didn't think about it. I used to think similar to the way she did, that that's just stupid. And I still think, you know, they're, they're pants. They should go around your waist. That's how they're designed. Use something how it's designed for, if that's the better way to use the thing. And because that is a societal norm in the way they live, they will be ostracized and not a part of their group if they don't adhere to a certain uh, dress code or to a certain way and manner of acting. So you can't just discount it right on the surface. Just dig just a little bit deeper and find out, because I guarantee you if you take that per same person away from that situation and, and give them a little bit of understanding, they'll all of a sudden realize, man, I sure can't walk better, and uh, it's easier to get around whenever I have my pants around my waist instead of letting them sag down past my ass. That's a lot of work. It's really hard. <laughs> but then you can go the complete opposite way of, man, it sure is a lot of work to wear a three-piece suit and keep your shoes always clean and you have yeah, to make sure, sure that you don't get any food on your tie. <laughs> like all that is a very, that, that wow, is more. there's not more, supposed to be any food on the tie? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that can be just as much and cumbersome as your pants around your ankles. Yeah, I mean, sure. that is just as hard, but we have to think about that those are the dress code for that situation. That's how anybody, they have to be and deal with people around them. They have to not fight and because they, that would make them feel unsafe. Yeah, You have to have those things. Well, I think the whole point of the conversation boils down to it's important for humans, for us to have a better life and a better future is to be able to sit and have an open mind and, and attempt the best of our ability to listen to the other person, bring our perspective, listen to their perspective, and boil out the truth of the matter the best we can and leave happy and loving and and work together in all ways that we can. I think that is the best thing. And with that, we're going to wrap up this conversation. And Mr. Schmidt, sign us out. All right. Hope everybody enjoyed the conversation today. You can catch us on all the alternatives. We're absolutely everywhere you want to look. Check us out on mysticsoftexas.com and have a good day.